Now every once in a while, <coughs> once in a while, it happens more often than you think. I come home and I open up a package of mail and I go through the mail, take out the photographs and whatever. And as you probably have noticed on a video, we we share a lot of magazines and pictures and photos and whatever. But anyway, one of the things, and and I'll only do spend a minute or here or so to uh, to thank Steve DeJulia. Mike Costello has just contributed to our railroad. This is real railroad train library. We now have. This is Steve DeJulia's, and he's added to a library that's growing by the day. And what it's done for me is these videos really, really make something special to be watching. Now we're we're in the peak of the building season. You, if you put in the amount of hours that I put into this, you really just get overloaded and burned out and tired, and I guess like all well, whatever, you know, you just like anything. You have enough, you have enough. Then along comes a day like today. Steve DeJulia sends me the video. I pop the video in while I'm at my desk working or out here working or whatever. Wow, along comes something really unbelievable, something I really can enjoy. I love real trains, as you probably by now have figured out. He also sent me this book. Now, it may not seem like a big thing to be sharing these books and stuff, but, but I can tell you one thing absolutely for sure. In the years to come, in, in time, uh, you know, when we all get older and older, it seems like, at least in my own life, when I'm done with in the shop for the day, I really like to sit down in our living room. I love Spitfire books. I love these books. And everybody, I want to take this special time. We're coming up on Christmas, a month or two from now, Thanksgiving, whatever, to take a minute just to thank everybody. It's been a little over 10 years since I've been in business doing this. I know I have, regardless of what anybody may lead you to believe, a lot of people that have a good special feeling in their heart for sharing things, and through our video and through our loaning and sharing and trading and whatever we are, like kids with baseball cards, we managed to add a little dimension to our life that might not, you know, might not normally be there. Now, the last couple of days, we had Dave here for a visit, and that's a special part of my life. George Venturini, a special part, John DeTavio. It just goes on and on. Mike Costello, to people from the club, Steve DeJulia, Robert Ray coming and doing my garden. And I wanted to take this time, it's an emotional time for me, just to thank everybody. Now, I have, in the next couple of days, I have a lot of work to do on my own fuselage to bring it up to the speed of where Joe's is. Joe's is finished, mine isn't. I'm going to get busy on that, but I think every once in a while it's good just to take a little reflection and say uh, thanks to everybody. I really do enjoy sharing this material. Georgino has shared a lot with us. And I like to be like, uh, encourage other people to, to do the same thing. Share the stuff you have, you'll get a lot more out of it. And I certainly feel like uh, my life has been enriched by the friendships and by the loaning and trading and scamming that we do to each other and making bootleg copies of everybody's video. So thanks a lot to everybody. And we have a lot of work to do in the shop in this upcoming week, so I want to clear the deck. I have to do a thousand pieces of mail today and well, hopefully tomorrow morning going to get started nice and early in the shop. By the way, I'm looking at this book. I got to tell you, I was looking at this over a cup of coffee. If you have any interest in, in railroads, God, this is just an unbelievable book. Now, and, and to show you how I've loved steam engines all my life and still even up to this day, I'm amazed when I see a steam engine at how it works and, and how many moving parts there are and how many, you know, s valves and everything there are. I ne you never can get sick of this. It's like footage of World War II airplanes. You just somehow never get sick and tired of it. So anyway, not to go on it forever, but thanks to everybody, and we're going to get busy on what may be one of the busiest weeks in the shop. Okay, the first mold first molded part come out of this mold this morning. Now what I really should have done, and I'm going to make another one, I'm going to make several of these for Dave, what I should have done is probably put a little more chop up in the front here. I can see I have the edges, and it's always the edges that are a problem, so I'm going to work those edges a little bit better. And then with whatever le resin is left over, I'll make a little patch on this, so in effect he'll have a spare one. I'll, and again, 
you never, you, at least it's unrealistic to me to think you're going to get this all perfect on the first shot, but at least this actually is a serviceable part. We could, we could dress this up and use it, but I want to experiment a little bit more with some of the different cloth that I have. Try this with the, the softer cloth and maybe putting some carbon reinforcements up here. A couple other things I want to experiment with. That's going to be the next, the first thing I'm going to do today is get that laid up. So when I mail these up to Dave, I maybe have two, three, four of them, how many I can get. And uh, then he can pick the best one. I can see this little piece here. You can see, uh, I guess, we get this before I trim it all off. I'll trim it off. This little chunk is where the wood, where I pack the mold with wood. So that's one thing I have to really be careful of, that I leave a little more material on future molds. Again, I'm just looking over this, and this is... I'm, I'm real happy because this, this mold really does have a lot a lot of curves similar to how I would want to make a whole fuselage. That's a relatively complex part relative to the other cowl. Now you can see relative to a sea fire part, a more complex shape. And this is a good, actually, this is a good way, and I want to just mention this. This, is, this has always been my philosophy or my theory, is when you want to start making some parts like this, make real simple parts, and these are real simple, of course. And we've kind of graduated into having something a little more complex, a little more uh, sophisticated. And what I hope this is going to be is just one more stepping stone toward even more complex parts, and ultimately with that, the whole fuselage will be composite. You know, I can also see a couple of things. From each experiment or each part I make, I try to learn something that I can use on all the other parts. This tight weave of this cloth, this, I don't know what, I gotta look at the label there. The tight weave of this cloth really made this a very rigid part too. So I can, now one of the choices I have is I can make a sea fire cowl using this cloth, a real tight weave cloth. And one of the things I can do is, see, I'm, I'm hoping with the lighter weave cloth I can get in here with one piece and make a ring. But even so, this is kind of stiff and especially up here, that's not going to have a problem with that, I don't think. Not only is the parts that I need to fix with some little extra resin before I can do I got a piece up here too. What I'm looking for is down in here I can pack the resin a little tighter and again I'll try that. Also back here I see this is nice and stiff but back here it's kind of flimsy so I'm going to run some carbon around the edge here. Give this edge a little bit of stiffness. That'll also make it easier when he attaches the 64th plywood edge should make it just a bulletproof thing because I think he's going to put the bolt in here anyway. But anyway, for the first shot out, I think we got a usable part here. What's, what's real handy is this sticky back paper. Some of these curves really lend themselves well to a uh, this, this sticky back paper that we've been using. with the way this came out. I'm going to make up another one off camera and then just of course use the extra resin here to do my repairs and patches. For a prototype I'd say that was real good. I'm just trying to get some of the roughness out of the inside here. This is just cosmetic. It may get a little bit of weight out too. There's some little sloppy pieces in here.
Now, I figure what I'd do, being this is a prototype, I'd work up all the little angles and curves. And what I'm seeing is a couple of things I can make improvements on in the next one. When I got in here, this the, the material in here is way too thick. I could even grind or sand some of that out. But I don't need to put seven layers. Of, I think Dave put about six layers of cloth in there. It's real thick up here, but this is all going to get cut out for the Venturi anyway. But I think this is just, just so I can see, I'm, I'm going to try to do this, that at no point is it thicker than three layers. So this, again, this is one good reason for, uh, you know, working up a prototype. Now, I wish, I never thought of it, I wish um, I had Dave's fuse here. Because I'd like to see what the clearance is around a Venturi and make sure I can choke the engine and anything else. But if we can't, he'll have to improvise something up here and then we'll make a change to the mold. I want to see if I have this stiff enough up here. That looks stiff enough. That looks good. As usual, the old kicker bottle. Boy, there's just, just no end to the amount of things a kicker bottle with sticky back sandpaper can work on for you. It even gets in here real nice. You've never used that sticky back sandpaper. You're missing one of the real treats of working on this kind of stuff. It really is a really is an asset to have. A couple of the things from having this part now, having this part completely out, I realize a couple of things. I need to make this area. This is the only area that's a little flimsy. So what I'm going to do. I know the 64th plywood will stiffen this up, but what I'm going to do is put one extra layer in this area here, and I know up here I don't need this strength, so I can save some weight in the next part, and I know for sure I don't need, you see this is the thickest part of the mold up here, it really has about six layers up there. And again, the, the, the technology here, or thing that's worked for me well, is while I make this up, the extra material I have, I can make these little patches, they grind right out the next day, and you're home free all. Now what I'm learning about, and, and each time I do this, I learn just a little bit more. What I'm learning is that it's best to make this a little bit on the thick side for doing the patches. Then what I do is, as soon as I get, get finished with the patches, I add just a little bit of the thin resin to it. And then I can do the layup with just a little bit thinner resin. But this is almost like mixing cement. George was here the other night watching this. and so It's just like mixing concrete. You just got to get the ratios. And it, there's a little bit of a test, I guess I showed this on the video already, but this is one of the things I'm learning from doing this over and over again, is just how how easy you can make it on yourself. If you get this, that it uh, just doesn't drip off. Just put a little pat until it just doesn't drip off. This seems to be, at least for doing patchwork now, talking about patchwork, when you get a big blob and it just sits there, and bloop, 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 that's just about right. Now one trick when doing patches, see that, ju just get to the point where it doesn't drip off the uh, the brush or the spatula. And just use this like like a paste. And it's always good, just leave it on plenty big, because it's, it's real easy to sand, so it's not a big deal. But what I was doing on the first couple of them, I was trying to make the patch all cute and pretty, and it really, it really didn't, uh, it was just wasted labor. Because eventually this is going to get block sanded out, and the material sands so nice and easy. This is not like epoxylite. Don't get the idea this is like epoxylite where you got to grind away till the cows come home to get it to sit right. And wherever there's any little imperfection, now whatever material's left over, I'll use to lay up the next cowl, of course. So in a one, there's one, in, I've been mixing one ounce of material. That seems, and like in here, I can just brush it right in, see? It's getting that thickness just right that's important. 
And even though this is a prototype, we'd like to have it be a usable part, of course. But I think all these little techniques, and I mean, each time I do this, I learn something I didn't do and know the time before. I'm always coming up with some little genius ideas. And I have a feeling anybody that did this kind of you know, stuff for a living would figure this out right away. It's just taking me a little longer than average, but I'm certainly on the learning curve already. And we certainly have parts that have been on concourse winners already, so that's a, at least one thing nice to know. Now what I'm going to do in here, and this is just for a cosmetic, is kind of clean this area up. A little extra resin up by that nose ring isn't going to hurt anything either. And this is where he's going to cut this away. So all this will be, this will just act kind of like a gel coat thing. Now I put selected little reinforcements in this piece. Again, probably what's going to really happen is when I pull this one out of the mold, we're going to find ways of even improving, you know, each each ongoing one. So I'll put these aside to dry, and we'll see what we can learn from the next little one. In the meantime, I can work on my fuse. Now back to working on the Seafire fuselages. This is the part I'm at now, and I've... Uh, Got a couple little thoughts and ideas for the nose section here, but the first thing I'm going to have to do for is set up the cowl. Now, luckily, having a lot of spares, even if I get this too thin or if I do something that I'm not happy with, I just have a spare cowl, and that's no problem at all. In fact, we have about six of them now, but what I like to do is try to make as much of a mirror image here as possible, and I can get all my measurements and dimensions and everything off the first one. So the blocks though that the... the uh, the molds, the shells, whatever you want to call them, they're ready to go. This is ready, and I'm just going to pick this up in the same sequence as I picked up the other one. But again, remember what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make little improvements as I go. So, And if I found something that really was better on this one, I just go back and retrofit it to that one. So, in effect, what I'm trying to have is that the both of the sea fires will be exactly the same when we fly, or as close to the same as possible. Now using a belt sander, of course, I'll do the same thing, is just work off as much of the edge as possible. Get the, get the fit that I want around the outside. And I'm just looking, because I'm always looking. See, this is the thing, I'm always looking. Now, I know on the other one I had to run some pieces up here. I'm trying to look for either better ways to do it, quicker ways, or some way of making it lighter. And if I can, I don't know. Well, i got to sand this down before I can go on to the next step, see if I can eliminate that one piece. Now, I did find one real nice use for that tool, that a power lock tool, is for dressing off these edges. Dressing off the edges with that power lock tool is a piece of cake. Remember this neat little guy? It's called power lock, and it really does work well. Now, I just want to show what the advantage of this over using the, the drum is run this on a slow speed. And I can get this edge real, real nice. A nice flat edge instead of a kind of a cut edge. It's also real good for getting in here where we have extra material. really good tool and I'm sure I'm going to find a million this is that ongoing thing where every one you do gets a little bit better now by looking at the first fuse I know I'm going to have a little gap in here that I have to fill in with wood but next thing is I want to get that 64th plywood plate on there so I can get the nose ring fit get some of these other fits just just you know, this one is really pretty decent but I know I'm going to have to put a little piece of plywood up the edge here, which will give me a nice edge. So, same as same as the other fuselage. So, just looking around for little ways here that uh, I could improve this. A good use for that power lock tool. So 
know what that does that's nice is with the drum does this it scallops it this takes nice big flat cuts and of course in the back it's real important because I want to get that taper that roll right into the bottom shell and you can just dress this off so easy now this really is one of the little improvements now having used that power lock a few times I can really say it really is a useful tool that is really one of those tools that you wonder after you have it, how did you ever work without it? Very handy. I made a couple of quick repairs up to these little chips and stuff that I had knocked out of this with CA, and they'll be fine. Laid out the line for this, and I want to hollow this all out. But what I want to do is, I'm just going to do the rest of this, this end of it off camera because we're getting near the end of the session. I want to think about what I want to work on tomorrow or the next time I get down to work here. George is on his way over here already. I want to roll up my plywood balsa tubes, ammoniaize them, let them soak and roll them up so that tomorrow I hope I'll be in a position or the next session I'll be in a position where I can get the balsa tubes installed. And, and that's one of the good things is at the end of every session try to think of what you need the next day and try to get the parts ready or get as much of it ready as you can ahead of time. I guess that's all we're going to do to the cowl today. I want to get those tubes rolled up. Now I had a few minutes here. I ran down, put the pin in the cowling, and I may even have enough time here before supper. I can just get, get the block angled in the shell and then get that little piece made up for the, uh, the cowling mount. One of the things I did around here is I, I drilled this hole. I you'd normally drill this with an eighth inch drill. I drilled it with the Dremel tool with a pointy bit just to get a nicer and a cleaner hole and with the angle shape just a little bit up, angle just a little bit up. And that seemed to make it a little bit cleaner and neater and quicker of an installation. I just thought I'd mention because many people have tried to do this and been real frustrated because as you go to put the cowling on, this pin, if it's not right in the right position, you can't really get it in the way it should. It's got to be kind of in the middle and as far to the top of the nose ring as you can get. And you can see, I don't know if, if we put this on a video before, but if you don't have this hole angled up, and this is Joe's fuselage, if you don't have this angled similar to the cow line, if you just drill it straight in, you almost it's almost impossible to get this in here because what will happen, this piece will hit before that catches. So knowing that in advance, and this is just the thing I was talking about, I guess, this morning when I worked here, knowing ahead of time that I might run into that problem, I angled that hole right up, and it worked real well a second time around. I always try to get this angle from the side, even though you really never do get it the first time. I'm trying to get that angle in there as I cut it. So I'm trying to pick up the high spot and just do it on a belt sander. Now I wound up putting some little doublers in here ahead of time. This has gotten real thin. I guess these are just a little bit different here. Now I didn't add these to uh, to Joe's fuse, but maybe I will. This is just some extra 16th doublers, and as I'm trying to get the cowl fit straightened out, I see for some reason this is. I guess I sanded too much off of this. I got this a little bit thinner than I wanted it, but it'll make it up, make up for it. Now I'm also going to take and put a piece, laminate a piece of sixteenth, or yeah, I guess sixteenth is enough inside here before I mount the uh, the bolt hole, the little piece of plywood.
Yeah, I guess a sixteenth for now will be just enough. I'll just laminate a little piece right in there. Now what I heh, was looking around here, and I had this piece, which is really one of the shells, the uh, shims for the shells. So what this will do, it already has the, the curve in it. I can just make two layers of this if I want to make it a little thicker. Save me a little work making up a template here. And it's just the reason I'm putting this on the tape even at all is to give you an idea that no matter how accurate you try to make it to be off that amount it is uh, not a big deal you can always thicken up one little piece in this case here and I'm sure once we get this all blended in we'll be right back to ground zero but I want to start off by having I don't want to have this become paper thin over here and then when I cut for the muffler and oh man no way I want to make sure I have enough material to do the sanding with Today what I was experimenting with, and luckily I, uh, I stumbled upon another good thing you can do with this power lock. At a real low speed, there's some angles. Now I had done all the little touch-ups on this, but it makes nice flat surfaces like the nose ring, which is what we're trying to get into a flat surface. Also real good around the edges, where we had touched up the edges on this. This is a prototype piece. I haven't taken the other one out of the mold yet, but boy, this puts a really, really nice finish on. And I'm finishing it off by hand, but I'm just, what I'm trying to do is find new and uh, useful ways of using this tool. This is really some super tool. Listen, with Christmas coming up, get your wife to buy you a power lock. Anyway, I had put resin inside here too, so I wanna kinda hit all the high spots here. This really, I'm, I'm very surprised how nice this works. This really is one of those tools that uh, I think if you pick one of these up, you're really going to be amazed how well it works. There's so many things. i just been finding things virtually every day I can do with this. Now, it just happens to fit a lot of the curves in this cowl. Of course, finishing this off with a little hand block is a piece of cake now. But you never know when you're going to just stumble upon one of those real good tools. In fact, when uh, when Dave was down here, we went and visited a little mill supply house, and they had a couple of tools in there. I wish uh, I wish Karen would buy me for Christmas, but I know she doesn't have that in her budget. These uh, really nice tools. There's a table saw with a lot of attachments, a little baby table saw that I bet you I could find a lot of good uses for. Anyway, I'm gonna just hand sand this one out so Dave will have a spare. I wanna pull the one out of the mold and see how much repair work that needs. So in effect, he'll have two cowlings for his upcoming, uh, you know, hope this is gonna be just what he had in mind. Okay, we got one kinda ready. This is ready really for a coat of auto primer. Pull the other one out of the mold and rough it out and try to get this in the mail to Dave today. Now the only spot we have to fill on this one is this little spot right in here. That looks otherwise some little pinholes and stuff here, but this one doesn't look too bad. To mount the muffler. Let's see what you got. Boy, is this liquid gold or what? Doesn't matter about mounting a muffler. Well, how much you pay for these? This one was a buck and a half. Okay. What else you got? Yeah, you got to get these off to Big Jim right away. Call them first. Yeah, this is okay. This is an old style one. I can make a strap for that. Three SD. Oh my God. This is, <laughs> this is better than hitting the lottery. Look at this. <laughs> oh my God. Now, if, if Mike happens to die on the way out. <laughs> Is there a receipt on these motors? Do we have that's any why, witnesses? That's why I brought Howard here for the witness. yeah, witness. witnesses. If his truck should explode on the way home, three. T that's a lifetime. There's your lifetime done. Now this is a real old one. See how the head is? 
The head is very high and raised. Right. And it's still got the thing for the muffler. You could even make a center bolt muffler for that. I have those. Good. Same good. thing with this one. Good. This is a K model, though. This is good. Yeah, you give Big Jim a call. See what his deal is if he's ready to work on motors again. Wow, you're home for you all. That's better than hitting the lottery, believe me. You never have to you worry. You feel like calling them and talking to them sometime, or do you want me to just do it? Yeah, just give them a call. All right. We got it. Now I'm back from what amounted to be a real nice trip to my mom's. Always interesting seeing my mother. God bless her, 84 years old, and she's in better health than me. But I was thinking, one of the things I wanted to test, I don't know if this is realistic to do this. I didn't get time because Mike Kajeski was here with all those beautiful 60s. One of the things I wanted to test, there's some pinholes and little chips and cracks and things. And I want to give this, really, really in, in essence, give it a fair shot. I want to mix up some polyester resin, some, this is Formula 27. Anyway, I put a little black dye in it so I can see the high spots and low spots. Dark colors are always better for that. I'm trying to find the best possible way to fill these little cracks and dings and chips and stuff. And I, I know I can fix them. I mean, I, I've already done it enough times. I know I can fix it by just mixing another batch of resin. But this will be a nice little test to, uh, to really to see if it can be done realistically with this, what amounts to be Bondo polyester resin. Now some of these, this one here, let's see if I can show this up close. This one here has a, a real chunk missing there and a chunk missing here, a chunk here. And I just, this is more of a test than anything else. And the only way you really know if you can do this stuff is by doing it. The unfortunate reality is that, you know, you can't call up your local Joe to body shop or something. He really doesn't have any, uh, any concept of what you're trying to accomplish. And again, since we have more than one of these and we can just make them anytime we want, if I waste one or one doesn't come out perfectly, it's quite okay. Now we'll let this dry. I have an awful lot of mail to do tonight, so while that's all happening, this can all be drying. A nice thing about polyester is relatively short drying time. And this will be one more interesting little bit of information we can add into our whatever you want to call it, our little database, knowledge base. And Dave will actually then have a spare cowling, too, to work on. Now, also, Mike Estella was here yesterday, and he loaned us a whole nother batch. Now, between Steve DeJulia sending me all his train stuff, making me crazy with all his train stuff, I feel like building a model railroad. But anyway, believe me, if the day ever comes that uh, we want to retire from the sport of model aviation. Trains are my second choice. Anyway, more on that later. We'll see how this works. This will be, an interest. This will, this will be one of those things. The interesting little tests you can try. By the way, that's some footage from Mike's video, which was a good one, by the way. That was really a good one. As always, one of the key things, little trick or whatever you want to call it, however you're going to use polyester or bondo, leave the original mix so you can see when it's starting to harden it up. It goes into that cheese state, which is where it is now. It's, it's like, uh, I don't know, macaroni or cheese or something. For about 20 minutes, and, and you probably, you know, you could still move it around and force it into corners, but once it goes into cheese state, you're pretty much finished with it. And I'm gonna put this up by the heating vent, put all my stuff away, work on a mail, come back to this in a couple of hours, and I hope when I come back, this will, both of these will be ready to sand now. This will be a good test. And the reason what makes this nice, the reason you can be a big spender with this stuff is, even if I screw both of these up, I'll probably make another one anyway. Mike Kajeski's working on his cardinal. We're gonna try to get him a cardinal cowling at it as soon as we get this mold fine-tuned. Now while I'm working, I always put this stuff, I need a fiberglass stuff up on top of the televisions right up near a heating vent. And that seems to really, uh, Kick it off maybe in an hour, hour, hour and a half, that'll be all set to go. Love these railroad videos, by the way. I'm, I'm really starting to build up a nice collection of them. There's some stuff on here. This is the Pennsylvania one, Mike Estella loaned us. Just unbelievably good footage. The Julia, if you're real good, I'll loan this to you. Play your cards right. One of, one of the things I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lay one of these up before I go do the 
the male here. And I never did get to try this. This is the Q cells. It's a thickening agent to make what amounts to be like a gel coat. And I just want to, it almost feels like talcum powder. Another material that I want to experiment with, maybe I can put some of this in uh, epoxy or whatever. I'm going to put some in the next layup of the, uh, the next test cowling. K4 races. Well, interested in seeing how this dries up. Again, I try to each one I try to make a little bit different, just to add to my my base of knowledge. Really trying to uh, learn this skill, and it is a skill. And I hope you're enjoying sharing all my experiments, even the failures. I really don't even know yet how many uh, layers of cloth. This is the open weave cloth. I've been trying to use this to bend it around corners. Again, we'll come up with a formula for this real soon. This is cowling number three in the mold right now. New York bound. This is ready to put away. In fact, I can trim some of this. And we'll have a little experiment on a Q-cells. I hope by tomorrow we'll have three functional cows, each one a little different, and each one adding to our knowledge base. Now in today's mail, and boy this was a good day, Ubi Degner sent me this picture. This is of Peter Germain's Saturn, Bob Hunt design. Looks real nice. But he's adding to his collection of videos. Now Ubi Degner, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, contributed significant amounts of stuff to our Spitfire program, pictures, books, magazines, uh, I remember getting several things. He's built the Cardinal, needless to say it's world class, really pretty too. He went to the World Championships, gave me his thoughts on the World Championships, and I'm, I'm really glad that he now has a whole bunch of videos, and I mean he has a significant amount, and he's going to have a lot more Spitfires by the time I finish this order. But one of the things that will allow him to do, I hope he will then, and I'm hoping he'll do this, is send them all around uh, to the guys in Europe. If he does make copies that go into their mode, he will then share them or uh, whatever he can do to promote it overseas. I'm real glad that uh, we have several people now that do have the videos overseas. I hope he will share them. Uvi, feel free. Share that information, my boy. Okay, thanks a lot for the photo. and. Uh, Look forward to seeing that next plane. By the way, Uvi passed a little word on to me. He's been corresponding with Joe Adamusco, and he loves that Spitfire wing. So don't be surprised to see a uh, something with a Spitfire wing coming from Uvi Degner real soon. Not a little bit of time I have left, and there isn't much left. Oh, come on, this son of a gun. I wanted to try to come up with, again, I'm always trying to come up with some idea, come up with some idea for making these tubes a nicer joint. Now, I did let this sit on the mold, piece of, piece of 5 8 tubing. Ooh, these did come out nice. These did come out a little nicer than before, but one of the things I, I realized I, I kind of cheated myself on is I should have put a nice edge on these before I joined them together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try a little bit different way of joining this. I'm going to try butt joining it with a little lip on there. Again, these are a little bit bigger. Oh, I have to trim these down. See, I don't want these to get too big. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to run a... What, I, what my plan was is to, while I have the both pieces in place, run the knife through in, in one score so that I've cut both pieces at exactly the same angle and shape and everything. Again, always trying to come up with a little idea here. I did talk to Dave Midgley in the course of the afternoon's business, and. What was real nice to hear is he found a source for large amounts of that silicone rubber, so I sent away for the product information. If we can get that at a less expensive cost, that'll be one nice thing. And I'm hoping I can, uh, I'm hoping eventually I'll have a mold for every cowling on the planet, every wingtip. I don't know what else we can uh, figure some way of using that stuff, but I know if I don't, move on. I'm just going to stagnate and be building one plane after another exactly the same. Okay, now the trick here is I'm going to try this on camera. I want to put this so it's right on the mold and then run the knife right down in one stroke at a pen. See how that works.
<laughs> so much for the razor blade method. I wasn't crazy about that, but what I want to try... Let me see if I can show this up close. What I'm trying to do, and I should have done this ahead of time, of course, is put nice straight edges on here and make sure they're parallel. And then assuming I had it nice, what I can do is get a nice tight fit. But even if you screw up at this point, what I'm going to try to do is get this dressed off on a belt sander. And just because you screw up once doesn't mean you have to live with it. Yeah, that should be a, oh yeah, that's a lot better. Now, I made a real nice joint on these. I don't know if I can show this on a close-up. A real nice joint. I just thought of a good thing, though. You know, I'm always thinking about stuff. There's some cigars you can buy. I just was thinking. They come in nice little thin, paper-thin aluminum tubes. So somebody out there, if you smoke cigars, send me the tube so I can avoid making these things up. Anyway, spoke to Big Jim. Big Jim's feeling a little bit better now, and it's good to hear his voice. So... I'm going to pack this up for tonight, and it's been a long day. It's, it has been murder. It has just been an unbelievable day. Winter is really here. It's really set in. And I want to pick this up either tomorrow. Well, we're going to get to see Joe within a day or two. I want to get the cowling mount made, take care of this, get the tubes in, and maybe have both of the fuses brought up to speed by the time I get to see Joe so he can uh, see both of them. I don't know. All right. See you tomorrow. It's time for pizza. Now, wow, this isn't, this is <clears throat> really a, I, I don't know if you're going to see all the details on the camera. I'm trying to use the macro lens. See some of the details. This is Klaus Makis's Tiger 46 powered ship. Just about everything Klaus does is completely, in fact, he always makes the pilot look just like himself. Completely detailed, perfect ink work, artwork, and he's, as far as I know, is about as professional as an artist as anybody in the hobby, including... Steve Busso or Ski or any of them. Look at some of the beautiful paintwork. I'm trying to show this as a, as a close-up, as close as I can. Some of the beautiful, beautiful work. Really a pretty plain Tiger 46. Now, Klaus had some interesting things to say in his letter. First off, he picked up a set of uh, Spitfire plans. I hope he's going to use them. I hope he makes one, in fact. But he was building some RC, tinkering with some stuff. He enjoyed going out to VSC, and uh, obviously someday maybe we can... Uh, get out the VSC and do that deal but in the meantime hey Klaus thanks for the picture and boy build a Spitfire unbelievable beautiful plane thanks for the photo now today is just one of these days you just you get days like this they started off doing a hundred little jobs around the house. Every job is going wrong here. But I did manage to find a really great little tip now. If anybody ever bought a coat rack like this, what happens, most people sell these coat racks. And you know, my, my wife, I don't want to say anything, collecting all this junk antiques. Because they don't stand right. The legs, when you have four legs, you never can level them off right. One of the things I did, I got that little Dremel, that power lock guy. I guess you can see on the floor. I shouldn't have been doing it on the floor. I should do it on a bench. I just been sanding the high leg, putting it back down until I get it straight in one dimension, and turn it 90 degrees and sand the other one until it's straight in that dimension. I don't know if you even can see this now, but it stands pretty nice and solid. And it really was a piece of junk before. It's still a piece of junk. Don't tell Karen. But uh, her and her antiques. Anyway, you you never run out of little tips, little things you can do with that power lock. That thing is just a great little tool. I know she's got a list for me a mile long today. See, this is what I should be doing. I should be working on this. Anyway, Joe's going to be over here tomorrow for the whole day. He has the wings, and we're ready to, uh, I'm going to try to tie up all these loose ends around the house today, and this is one of them. Anyway, that little power lock did work well. The nice part is with this, like in other things, you really can fine-tune. When you cut pieces of the leg off, oh, man, you always have, it's wrong this way, it's wrong this way. With this tool... Believe me, you can just dress it just a little bit. I take it out to the cement floor, put a level on it. Perfect. Works good every time. This this is really just 
the whole idea. This is one other little use you have for this tool. Now, I'm just guessing. I'm guessing one of the other things, too, is when, and I know Karen's going to buy more junk, that needs to be refinished. This would be a great tool, like when we refinished the railing upstairs or something. This, this is one. I I can't. I'm saying it over and over. I know I'm repeating myself, but this is something everybody that has a modeling shop, this is something you can wind up putting to good use. Now, another thing, too, when a newcomer to the world of videotapes, Brent Bills, he's been sharing a lot of stuff with me here, and I figured I'd put some of this on a... He picked out some good articles for me here. Again, just the wonder of video that you're able to... And obviously, this is all stuff that... Uh, I'll check this whole magazine out before I return it to him, but th it just seems like there's an unending supply of people out there in the real world that have interesting things they've done with their life, and they're perfectly willing to share them. And once you have videos, it just makes sharing them so easy and, and so much fun, really. Brent Bills, thanks a whole lot. I get back to doing antiques today after I finish the mail. Another thing, in redoing all these old antiques, I always run into these old screws that have no slot left. They're all rotted or filled with paint or something. And a Dremel parting wheel. Boy, that makes a nice, just carve a brand new slot in a screw. So easy then to repair it. You know, just, just, or well, use all your modeling tools. That, you know, if you get involved in something like this, every one of them gets put to good use. I found out too is ah that, that screw is stuck in there. What I found out too, I'll have to pull this out. Putting a little CA around the screws before I put them back in is always wow, that really is so locked in there. Put a little CA around the screws, it hardens up the wood so they get a better bite too. Imagine if this was World War II, Winston Churchill said, okay, everybody build as many sea fires as possible so we can stop the uh, German invasion. You know, and Karen would be there. But Winston, we need antiques. We need antiques. Oh, gee, more antiques. Oh, God. <sighs> anyway, luckily, the last project she's got lined up for me, and then I'll be able to get to work is she's got her plate collection. I don't know how many... Women out there have these, I don't know what they are, collector plates. Look at these. She's got them all over the place. I, I could own uh, 25 tune pipes of what she's got tied up in plates. How many of these plates do you have, Karen? 13. 13. Anyway, what we're going to do is, after the Jets get done losing another game, we got some of them up there. We want to try to get them up here. It's our beautiful kitchen anyway. My wife's known for keeping a clean kitchen table, lots of tools. Very nice, Karen. I'm sure Debbie would be impressed. Yeah, hey, by the way, I got the word today from, uh, well, I guess it's an unofficial word from Lou Klein that I had won the election for District 2, which is kind of cool. Give me something to do on rainy days. Look at this. Look at, look at this happy wife. Now, see the happy husband building sea fires. Look at how happy she is. Oh, that Wendy, what a great oh, husband he is. <laughs> Cut his shoulders off. Sacred around here. Can you imagine that mean wind Paul picking on my wife? Can you imagine? Look at this. Oh, my Thank God. You. Look at this. Well, I got to let you take the brunt of the pun. <laughs> I don't think so. Look at this. Oh, we're going to have Thanksgiving dinner. Midgley, eat your heart out. Mmm. So nice. Take it when it's and done. after Joe, later on this week, actually, we're going to put the Christmas village up. When you take a picture when it's all done, that... Done! It's... People in the construction trade like to th see things being done. Not done. Any idiot can take a picture when they're done. Yeah, yeah. This is... This is... Hey, probably this is the last time you'll see our living room without that giant village here. I know you're bored. 
I was amazed last year how many people said that they enjoyed watching that village go up. Amazing. Well, we're not going to put it, we're going to put it up all in one day this year, so. Anyway, Seafire Production being held up by chinaware and antiques and plates and coat racks. Unbelievable. We're never going to win the war this way, Karen. It's okay, the war's over. Nobody told you, huh? Nobody told me. Winston Churchill didn't tell me. He's dead. Anyway, it looks nice. It looks very nice. Now you can tell, Seafire production was on hold today, but we got all the plates up. Table looks good, baby. Are you filming? about nice, nice stuff. Now Karen's friend Helen made these pillows. Look at these pillows. Kind of nice. She made all of these, right Karen? Yes, every one of them. Oh my god. Nice. Handcrafted. Does she make Spitfires? No, she leaves that to you. <laughs> she doesn't want to compete. And just one final plate here, the cardinal plate. Oh. Anyway. Another great day, getting nothing done. We got Joe's fuselage ready. Joe's going to show back, show up tomorrow. Hope we're going to have a good day with Joe. And it's time to get some sleep here. And as Joe unloads the car here, we have our uh, prototype wings. Oh man, these are, these look awesome, Joe. Awesome, awesome. Well, they're a little different shape than last year because I just noticed this on most of that needs a CA. Yeah, we'll do a little repair the on that. The are in. Okay. Uh, the tips, these, the inboard tips are not hollow. I, and I know you want to do something with a new... Yeah, I'm going to re-engineer something there. So I don't want to go through can, that again. What I figured you can do is like shape this all to how you want it. Yeah, yeah. And then pop them off. Here's uh, And then the tip blocks. Okay, you got all that made up. Yeah, they're all done. Yeah. All right. And I've got them numbered. One, two, three. And you got the numbers, the wings. Now, which one do you want? Well, Is there any one in particular? Take the lightest one. Leave the heaviest one for me, because I'll have what, no trouble. What did you do with the other five? Oh, I put them up there. Okay. I'll have no trouble saving the weight on a finish. And I like to get these to come out identical. That's the major right. goal. Let's see. I got the wings numbered this way. Okay. This is number one. Okay. Boy, you've been busy, baby. Yeah. Man, busy. And I try to try to do this production style. You know, when I was molding leading edge skins. Yeah, and, yeah. I see if you come over here. Wendy's. Movie Degner's making a Spitfire too. You know. I sent him. Uh, did you send him plans and stuff? No, I, he's, I, I don't. I don't have any plans for he, Spitfire. Oh, he's hot. Oh. But I sent him. I sent him the kind of drawings that I had working on. See right in here. Maybe if you get around this side, you can see. Oh, okay. Number three. The core, 6.5? That, that was without the tips. Okay. 6.5, number two was 7.25. Believe me, the heaviest one will be light enough. Well, number, number three is, you know, if I could get my hands on number three. I'd okay, be... we want to make the lightest one up for you. We get the controls in today, yeah, maybe. Because, you know, I... Well, Make up some belt cranks, whatever you feel like we doing. We don't work and we just shoot the breeze. Man. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what George is going to be in a mood for, yeah. too. George's wife is still... So what I did with the tips here, and I see this is marked number Let me get one. over there and I can... Oh, I love that airfoil. Oh, my God. No. Yeah, okay. Now, if you have a 440, I can... Yeah, in that box there somewhere, there's 440s. You got to... You don't... You got to set with the... Uh... When, I, when I get rich, I'm going to have real tools. You know, like new wrenches that aren't all rounded off on a tip. That's not... I bet that's it. Midgley's well on the way to having his ship finished. He's, ready, he to put, well, he's ready to put the wing in the body. He better be anyway. You got the wing and filler coat. These look beautiful, Joe. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Let's see. What I need here is a 330 seconds. Right. 
You don't need a lightweight bolt in a tip weight it's, box. If it's too heavy. No, you're gonna put weight there I anyway. Do. That's it what I mean. Don't mean anything. See, the thing is, it's unshaped. Yeah. I know you want to get that to the kind of. Point. Yeah, I like to get points. The only thing is, you got to watch on. One of them is a little hollow inside. I mean, it's well, a little thin. It, it's not that as much as when you start to, if you're gonna taper down more, you might, you might want to find out exactly where I, I should have. Hold it up to a light bulb. Okay, because let me show you what I did on this one. And if they get real thin, you can hit them with thin CA. That's no problem. I kind of yeah. can't see that, but I patched that. But you can, you know, this is for number two. Well, we'll eventually. And I even got the tip weight hatch on the bottom. That's amazing. On all three. All three of them. Yeah, all three. I'm telling you, that's amazing. Okay, so that's, you know, standard. Davey's trying to showboat here. I'm trying to make fun of Midgley making that tip with the box on top. Oh, man, and he sells the plane to Ferguson and thinks nobody will know. Okay, so that's that one. That looks great. That's two. And um, weight-wise, they're, they're all the same, pretty much. Well, what you can do, too, Joe, I'm just thinking, you can weigh up all the flaps, take the lightest set of flaps for yourself, too. Get, get all the light stuff on your bird, because I know you're going to put more paint on this than I do, and I know they're going to both be light okay, enough. Okay, now here's what I did, uh, the flaps... I got pretty good sea grain. This this is maybe Whoa, the only one that looks isn't good. good. This is really good wood here. Whoa. This was. Did you weight them up? Put them on a scale and take the lightest set. Right. Hey, I'm turning. Because what I want to do, I want to put those those cuts in yeah. for the fillets. Hey, so I don't want to cut one up and you. You, you figure that out. Now see yeah. what I did with these things. And I remember last. These year, are the tiplets. Yeah, yeah the I tiplets. remember that. Don't put them on until you get the flaps all laid out, the horn in and everything, or you'll be going crazy. But uh, the scenario is you might want to uh, you might want to duplicate this out of maybe a little heavier piece of wood so that when you can have something to sand into. I don't know. You could figure that mm. out. But what I may do this year is but that's when I sand into this... What I'll do is fiberglass over it so it's a little stronger. Last year they were kind of, because I got them so thin, I made them real thin at the end. You know, I love to get these things razor edged. Oh boy, that, that when you see a plane with fat, oh, bah, right, razor edges. Anyway. Razors. That, that's what made this thing. Cause even oh yeah. I look at mine. Go look at mine over there. Oh, yeah. There's razors all over the place on it. So flaps, <clears throat> these little extra pieces. Yeah. That's it, but they're all the same, man. Now the difference is the gear are coming out where? They're coming out at. You got you figured out seven inches here, or how, what did you figure for the? Last year they were in this bay. Okay. They were out one more bay. We're we're in a whole bay we're on in each a whole side. Bay. And this okay. will be. 12, that'll be fine. Twelve and a half. Yeah, that'll be fine. You don't want it any closer than that. Now let me show you this inside. All this will be the same on all three. And I got a tight a joint and fit that I could possibly, you know, get in here with the, the wood fits and everything. It's just like rough sanded with 220, mm. uh, but I got the radius is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. Again. Let's see if you can see this. I'm sure you can, but the radius is on these. Now, another thing that's nice and, and Joe knows about it, is when you radius this is get, see the leading edge sticking out here? I don't know if you can see it because He's got a little toothpick. You put toothpicks in there? Yeah, right there. Okay, that's our center yeah, toothpick line. Toothpick is right there. That becomes our center line. What I line try to for do this. when I radius that, I took that uh, piece of 3 8 square leading edge and, right. and I try to get like a 3 30 seconds. To a the, band of it all uh, along. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you got so, a band going right down so the whole leading you, edge. Keeps you honest. Yeah. And, but uh, we didn't have any warp problem last year, so. Nah. Can't imagine you got. How can you get them twisted when you build them on rods? Look at down this hole. If you've never built a wing on rods, look at down the hole so you can see the holes for the rods going right through the whole wing. And Let's see here. The bottom bell crank or spar joiner is epoxied in. Okay. And then this is, you know, for your... Right. For, for capping in once the bell cranks are in. Click right in there. Yep. Same as... And I even much put the spars in, right? Really? So that we have the reverse bell crank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Man. It's all proven stuff now, though. None of this is... Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. This time last year, this stuff was kind of like, oh, it'd be nice if this works. Now you know it works. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you know what the second date's going to be like. You know the first and one went the good. Other, well, see, I see I really got some cracks in the number one there.
Put some CA on the inside. Yeah, that's one thing I didn't do. I didn't. Take some, there's some thin CA down there. I'll let you handle that. I didn't, uh, didn't thin CA the inside, you know, to toughen up or harden up the... Okay. But they're all in there, and I got the little reinforcers in the center. Right, right. All the things click together and fit. You got it all made with Ambroid, by the way, if you can't see Ambroid, it on the Ambroid, and I did use... Let's uh, see if you can see this on the I did use tape. some uh, thin CA to, you know, tack things, but everything's straight. These wings are straight. Airfoils are, you know, right where they're supposed to be. Hey, it's three of these babies, though. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. Why didn't you make four? <laughs> we could go in business. <laughs> anyway, I got Midgley's cowling over there. I'll finish sanding that out today, get that up to him. The canopies are... We got to redo the mold a little bit. The mold he had problems with the CA blistering off it. So, but other than that, man, we're on track. I'm ready to start working. I got one more day over there to, uh, you know, clean up the other house, and then I'm going to be on this full time right after Thanksgiving. I mean, start grinding out some 14-hour days on this. Awesome. Everything's the same. same awesome. Same joints as last year. Yeah. All that stuff uh, worked. Yeah, That's the beautiful I mean, even, part. Even the trailing edge here can be thinned down probably a 30 second on the yep. top and the bottom. Once you get your sanding block going, I know you'll... Oh, yeah. Sand. Yeah, no, I sit for hours on end and get that right. And the tips, so when I talked to you, it was too late to... Uh, yeah, that's not significant. That's, that's baby here. stuff. I don't even worry about that. But that sure that show up nice on that. Uh, oh, yeah. No, it, it's fine, believe me. I tell you, that does look nice. I have to, admit, <laughs> I have to admit, that does look pretty good, hey, the Joe. Your blocks are in. Yeah, they're ready. They're ready. I can't wait to get working. Number one, number two, number three. One, two, three. Oh man, Detavio is gonna flip when he sees those wings. Yeah, when you see John, tell him I said hello. He's gonna flip. Yeah, that's a good. That's another year's work sitting right there. I thought you were gonna throw this away. No, Midgley brought that down. Oh, he did. Here we got the we got the green stuff that, finally. That's the stuff. This right this there. stuff is the forget it and this is the good. I don't know. Don Patterson brought that over. We got the green. Midgley found it up in uh you know, you can't buy it here anymore. It's gone. He got it up by him in New Hampshire. That was great seeing Joe today and I'm going to try to finish up this cowl. By the way, this Bondo is the uh the polyester is looks like the material of choice for filling these little holes in here. And this cowl will go up to Dave tomorrow. We have to do some work on a canopy mold, so he's going to send it back to me, and I'm going to make a rubber mold from that. We'll probably get to that as soon as I get the canopy mold back. But this really was, this was a little bit of an improvement. Getting this, I don't know if you can see this, let me... See if I can get this on a close-up. Getting all these little spots filled in, I think you can see how nice and smooth this came out. Very little sanding, and that's with the polyester filling. So this guy will read ready to be go up to Dave. I have a spare one for him ready, and one I'll take out of the mold and trim. So basically he'll have three canopies, three canopies, three cows to work with, and boy, these are really nice. This this is what we were hoping would be the final product, real right here. Okay, I got the cowls all bagged up. One is final sanded. One still needs the holes cut and some various little extra sanding. And I left a raw one. Now, this might be for Peter. Peter's building a cardinal kit up there. He may want to uh, have one, so this will save me the job of making and getting one up to him. I think three will keep Dave in business, and I'll get those in today's mail. Now, not one of the more exciting jobs in the world around here, but making up line guides. I'm going to try to make up about, I got enough parts to make 200 of them tonight. And this is one of the reasons, see, I I just love having all these videos because I'm checking out the videos, listening to music, and what normally would be a terribly boring job here turns out to be something that's, uh, you know, I can live with it. Now, if you've never seen these, these are made out of glass nylon. They really do fit mostly uh, airplanes with thick wingtips it would be tough to get this in a half a plane but the fact is it really is a functional serviceable part it's only a couple of grams heavier than the wood ones and one of the things believe it or not one of the parts that I really am going to improve on the Seafire over there 
is the lead-out guide. Last year's lead-out guide, the screw, if you remember, the blind nut worked its way into the bell crank and jammed it all up. So I'm going to be making an improvement to that. And I'm going to, uh, you know, hopefully get 200 or so of these together tonight. I don't know. It, it's not the most exciting job in the world, believe me. Uh, just one little quick story that I want to re relate to somebody. I better not mention his name, but somebody had bought one of these guides at one time and called me back and said, Ah, too heavy. No good. I'm going to make one out of light ply. And I said, Okay, cool. And I know, I know for a fact, because <laughs> I was there when it went in, Crash Omatic. And that's one of the things you never really can evaluate. All, the, all these engineers in our hobby to come up with these great lightweight parts, including me. Making that lead-out guide out of the plywood, if I go back and look at the video, what I did, I didn't leave enough of a bolt in the back. I tried to cut the weight down, only leave two or three threads. But what I should have done is swedge the end over so that the blind nut wouldn't work its way into the bell crank. So that's a lesson you can take, take from me first, first hand, believe me. This is not a great place to try to make the worlds. Don't make this out of cardboard or out of uh, something really super light unless you like repairing crashes. And by the way, this originally originally was designed for planes that had the original pattern masters and BJs had flat plywood wingtips that it could glue right into the wingtip. Now, had I known at the time we were going to go to these real thin Spitfire tips, I could have made it a little bit thinner. Just not appropriate to use it now. And if you build a Seafire or a Spitfire, one of the things you really can't use, this is just too wide, but if you make one of the, uh, the planes with fatter or wider wingtips these are still a good choice and all the people that are out there complaining they're too heavy you know what I don't know this is not a great place to save weight this would not be my first choice there are certainly a lot of other reasonable places to save a tenth of a gram this is really a good solid part other thing and I'm just trying to hit all the things that I know about on these guys that are significant You'll notice the holes are a little bit oversized. If you if you have this mounted 90 degree to the hinge line, sure you can hot stuff in some eyelets or some lead out eyelets or whatever. But the reason these are oversized is a lot of people put them in like the wings that have a little bit of a cant to them or anything that's elliptical. Of course, this really can't go in at 90 degrees. And if you wind up with a bind at the lead outs, you're going to wind up with the lead outs going through on an angle. The oversized holes are fine. It's not a problem. The only time this is this should have a bushing in it is if this is 90 degrees, perfectly 90 degrees to the hinge line. And even then, it's a good idea to leave a little bit of slop in here. Having these real tight and not a good idea. Always allow a little bit of play in these holes. Boy, it feels good to get these done. See now. Once I get ahead on all these component parts, then I can put the next batch of kits together. I love your dress. Do you? It's pretty. Now, while we're doing lead-out guides, let's make a pretend airplane up here. This is probably one of those questions that an awful lot of people need a, a ballpark answer on, and this is a good time to give it. Now, what you need to know when you set the lead outs for the bench trim, you need to know exactly where the plane balances. And you need to know this dimension to the hinge line, assuming you have a straight hinge line. Now let's pretend for the sake of argument this was eight inches, which is a typical number for a pattern master. And you'd like it always to start off at 15% of the mean average cord. Well obviously what you need to do is interpolate this line out it's not really accurate of course but what you want to do is have the mean average point and it's the average point that the lead outs come out that average point is in the center the mean average point relative to the center of gravity from one inch to one and a half behind as a good starting point if you're at eight inches let's just make a pretend situation up you want this mean average point to be anywhere from 7 inches to 6.5 just for, for openers and it's the mean average point in other words if here's the tip 
and here's your two lead outs coming out it's irrelevant where this one comes out and that one comes out. You always work off the mean average. If the lead outs are real close together, and I have never found any advantage to getting them close together, except that <laughs> I've heard that it keeps the plane from yawn and does a lot of this, but keep in mind, a lot of the stuff you hear about the world of stunt, a lot of it is really mumbo jumbo is given it the benefit of a doubt. But this dimension, if you're from the balance point, and your mean average point an inch to an inch and a half back the odds are real good real good you're gonna find you'll be in the ballpark really in the ballpark just like the same thing when we set a plane up to fly for the first time I don't know, this is a good time to mention it this prop tip if you measure this and you're about a quarter inch this number should be a quarter inch shorter than this number on a 13 inch prop. That's really a good ballpark place to start. So if you start with this amount of offset, an inch to an inch and a half at the lead outs, you got the ballparks of having that plane set up. You're real, you should be really close in fact to having what will amount to be your final trim. Just thought I'd mention that while we're doing a, a batch of lead out guides. I'm trying to get back to working a little bit on a fuse. Don't think I'll get much done here, but maybe I can get the bolt sunk in and lay out the uh, the tubes. Now what's nice is they've been sitting for a while, so I can get the blind nut put in here. And there's nothing special. That's the best thing I've learned about this is do it with a Dremel tool and not with a drill. That makes for a get your alignments squared off. Make sure it's in what you think the center should be or close to the center. Want to get it preferably at 90 degrees to this so I kind of look down sight down here to get a 90 degree you don't want this running off on an angle somewhere that I got the screw the little arrow shaft in just like the other thing and the only thing is I moved the screw I had it a little bit too far back so I moved that position up Now, a good way to know if you're getting it symmetrical is to look at the shaving out actually in the plywood. When they're equal, you almost know you have that curve real close. But it's not, it's not difficult to get the blend in there just right. As soon as I get it the way I want, I'll put some thin CA on there. That'll be the... In like fact, this side is down a little lower than this side. You know, I can get this relieved out in here and then get a nice bead of thick CA up in here. Get that radius built. Yeah, I got about an hour of blending and sanding here and relieving and I gotta do that yet. I'm getting tired though and this is one of those nights We've had, we've had them every once in a while. One of these nights where just about everything I did, I was tired and it's not going the way I want, so I'm going to kind of back off. I have one more day of work, I hope, and I'll be ready to put that top shell on, get the top shell, but it, everything did work out nice. This blended in nice. I always like to look at it at the end of the night and just get an idea. The rest of this I don't care about. Once that fits up there, it'll be no problem at all. Not today. <laughs> oh man, ran off. This is this is really a test cow. This is with this material for uh, Ed Gallagher. He wants to try uh, seeing if he can come up with some ideas for improving this. Now one of the things 
he's going to mail me, and I hope I'll get it in the next couple of days, is some material that you pre-prime the mold with. So in other words, you put the, the primer on the mold first, and then lay the fiberglass. And now this isn't pulled apart yet. i got to pull this. I want to see what this looks like. Just give me a second here. Easy, easy opening cans. Here we go. Anyway, this one doesn't look too bad. Got one little dimple there, but I'm going to... Yeah, Car. Okay. Money, 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 money. Oh, boy. Okay. I'll send this down to Ed, and uh, like I said, that material, we spoke last night the other, the other night for about three hours, in fact. Had a good conversation. And Ed, of course, has done a whole lot to help me out in the past. So I want to... Uh, Try that material, and it, it supposedly you prime the mold first and then lay the fiberglass, and it'll be interesting to see how that works. Now, this morning, I finally get back down here. Whew, it's been a long time. Okay, I want to get this trimmed out. This will make room for the air tubes. But before that, I want to get the motor in here and cut out all the exhaust openings. The last time I worked on this, I kind of got this blended in, and again, I looked at both sides to see it was kind of symmetrical, got this all radiused off. So I'm ready to do most of the final detailing up here, and now that I have the wings, I'm really psyched. I'm really getting uh, pumped up that I can get some more work done on the wings maybe even today. Now one of the little traps I've fallen into in the past is I try to save a little time and only put one bolt in the motor, and the motor would be just a little bit crooked and none of these holes would really line up. So when doing some of the cuts, and these are important cuts, my, uh, my rule of thumb is you always use a motor that doesn't have the holes enlarged, number one, and don't use a motor, and we ran into this with Midgley's uh, fuselage, that doesn't have, that has the sides ground away, and then you build a fuselage and you go to put a motor that doesn't have the sides ground away and it doesn't fit. You know, I could lay out the needle valve hole and the exhaust hole. That is, of course, the template is real handy in laying this out. And I always try to line this up by looking down this way so I can get an interpolation of where that line ri lines up. You notice all the cows, or I hope to get most of them anyway, that, that the line of break runs right through the needle valve hole. This way, when you take the cow off, you don't have to disturb your needle valve setting. It's just one handy little extra feature. Yeah, I like to get these edges all hardened up as soon as possible. Now I can do the same thing as just transpose these lines right out onto here. But this is a good way of getting getting these see I'm trying to reference off of the I can see down through the exhaust port and I can see I don't have this exactly parallel so now I can grind this away now I can reference off the other edge of the exhaust port this one's not too bad but I can get this all nice and even up here now. Now a nice way to get the final tuning, this is a nice tip, is using your eye for reference on that edge just use a piece of masking tape to run this edge, then reverse it and put the masking tape up here. You can actually use the edge so that you get these edges perfect. You can imagine, and I've done it myself, you get a beautiful hole in there and it's, it's not really even. 
and getting a nice edge on this, the final thing, and it's a good tip, the final cuts you can cut with a grindstone. A grindstone doesn't tear material away, it kind of burns its hole right in. Now that's a good tip. And it's all these little details, believe me, when they add up all these nice little edges, the line going right through the middle, the fact that this isn't all cocked off to one side. And as soon as you get this sanded out, first thing, and you're real happy with it, harden that edge up with thin CA. Always nice if you can get a piece of tubing that's exactly the size of the cut. This way you'll get a perfect radius in that. And it'll tell you if you have a little high spot there, you can use the tubing as a guide. Remember, one of the one of the key things, one of the key advantages of a side exhaust motor instead of a rear exhaust motor is it exhausts the heat out of the fuselage. It doesn't stay in that area right behind the motor. So to maximize that, I always leave plenty of, this is the thickness of a tongue muffler, leave plenty of air clearance around. Now I know a lot of people like to have this real tight fit. It looks all cute and sexy, but you know what? It's a problem. It's trapping heat in there. Let this be one of the exhaust outlets. Leave enough clearance around here, probably a sixteenth of an inch minimum. Or you could even put a tongue muffler on there. Now next thing I'm going to run a wire through here, put the motor in that has these holes drilled out, tap them and drill and tap those holes out so I can remove the muffler from the other side. I don't have the holes yet, but keep in mind that's a significant, significant advantage of a side exhaust motor. It gets the heat and the muffler that's hanging out in the airstream acts as a radiator, pulling heat out of the motor constantly. And once I get this apart, I like to radius all the edges inside, harden everything up with the thin CA to keep my edges. I want that airflow to come right through this, so I'm trying to radius all the edges in that direction. Now I want to get that all cleaned up inside, get the edges solid, and I want to get the other motor in and run those the holes for getting the wrench in. That'll be the next step here. Now what's nice here is I can check my needle valve fit, and believe me, <laughs> you think you think this could never happen, but you know it's always a good idea to check it. And what I did, I went out and got a really long drill. Maybe I'll show this on the tape. I got a long drill so I can run this right through the motor itself without a problem. Now one of the things I want to do here, this is important, important to me anyway. Maybe a piece of sandpaper for a shim. I want to make sure I have the same clearance on both sides of the motor. See, now this side is tight, even though nobody's going to ever notice this, believe me. But now I can just put that curve back in there until I have the same amount of clearance on both sides. It makes that, that opening just perfectly symmetrical. Now one way to do this is by taking a piece of tape. I want to, I want to move the tape until I have it like eyeballed. And then I can just take the Dremel drum and just grind a little bit, but I'll basically check that I have the same clearance on both sides with some kind of 
Folded up sandpaper is a good shim, but anything that acts as a shim. I got it roughed out with the Dremel, and I'm just trying to get... It's always good on these kind of curves. Gold kicker bottle seems to be exactly the right size. Get anything that has that radius in it. Otherwise, you're going to wind up putting a flat spot in it, more than likely. This lets you get both edges real, really accurate. More little details. Now we got it just about equal. Cowling is pretty much finished in all the rough out stages, but this is a radius that I don't want to have a razor blade, and then what will happen is the paint will start peeling off, so I want to now get what I hope is going to be a smooth radius on all the edges. I have almost all the work done here, and then I want to marry up this slot with the where the air tubes are going to be in the top block. So that the two edges, I don't want that lip holding the air back from getting through the cowl. Now I want to make sure that I get this angle. I don't want the angle to be this way because when I'm all done, I'm going to wrap 64th plywood right around here to turn this into a former. So I want to real carefully, after I've Dremel tooled this off, work this angle so this piece of plywood will go up and around and actually form the outline of a former in 64th plywood. And of course that won't get done until the wing is in the body and we're doing the final glass work on the nose. Now every once in a while that, that sandpaper will obviously wear out and what's nice about these sticky back guys is you can peel a peel it right off if you don't have sticky back paper you can always use contact cement spray adhesive you can actually use rubber cement even but this stuff really this is the cat's meow this is really pro I like this and you've got another sanding stick Again, this is one of the, maybe it's a little tricky, I don't know to understand, I don't know, I can't get through the whole thing. But I want to have this edge really running parallel to the fuse sides. Okay, we should be ready to cut out the air vents now. That's the next thing, lay out the air vent holes. And it should give a nice clear air path right through there. And before I go any further, I want to seal all these edges up with thin CA so I keep keep this as fuel proof as possible and get a nice big blob of thick CA around the blind nut so that doesn't jump out halfway through the flying season. these holes just eyeball them. And this will help get the get them so they're kind of even I guess. Again this is just an eyeball deal. Now if I had Joe's fuselage here what would have been nice I don't have it here anymore I could have made a little template right off the fuselage that would have been cool. See I forgot to do that. this symmetrical is I'm sanding this edge and this edge at the same time 
And as soon as I see, see I've hit the tape, now I know I can't go back any further and keep them even, or else I have to make the same amount on both sides even. Getting these even is really, uh, you know, I don't know, there's, there's just a little bit of a technique to it. I hope you can pick it up off the tape if you ever decide you want to put these kind of scoops even in, uh, you know, a cardinal or whatever. I'm ready to do a little, just tack glue these in and then make sure I get them both lined up the same way. Now I got it pretty well centered so I can get some thick CA here to hold it and then I have to fill in the gaps, get some scrap wood and pack it in there. I can just hit this all with thin CA and then trim everything off. here is to get these edges nice and hard. There's still little low spots. Now once this kicks off normally, this is thick CA, once this kicks off normally then I can grind that right in and I should have a real good edge. hand makes the best. Best way to feel for little rough spots is with your fingertips. Now one of those tips that's worth its weight in gold is leave the inside of the tube. Anytime you have a reverse curve where dope will tend to shrink up and pull together like in a fillet or inside these scoops. Leave the first coat before you put the first coat of dope on. Leave it good and rough. Now we have CA in here, so I can get a nice tooth sanding it with, with 100 grit, trying to get a nice rough uh, texture so that that first coat of dope will get a good mechanical bond. Now last thing on this step, I want to break that edge. You know how there's always things, and I always use that uh, Empire of the Sun, there's, there's always movies or videos or whatever that get you through a long day of sanding and grinding. This is one of them with this, when they wreck the daylight, I just love this, I could play this footage over and over again. Burt Lancaster movie. Anyway, when you have these long, tedious, this is really a tip worth having. Long, tedious jobs like this where I'm just grinding and filing, grinding and filing coat after coat, I want to get this perfect. Having some of these cool videos is a big help. Hey, to Julia, I hope you enjoy this anyway. Anyway, Mike Estello was good enough to bring over a whole bunch more of trained videos the other night. But we're really getting ourselves a nice collection here. That book that Julia lent me is just awesome. Just awesome. Anyway, what happens if you don't have this, it just seems like there's times, well, you just want to uh, get it over with. Well, having some good entertainment. This is unbelievable. I love this. Play this a thousand times. It's still good. Hey. I wish I knew if anybody out there maybe knows if they really did wreck the real daylight. 4449. I don't know if they did. Cool, though. Anyway, we're almost finished with this. That's about all I'm going to get here for the time being. And that really did come out pretty nice. Now I want to make up that the little former that goes behind the uh, the air inlet tubes. Now I want to let just this is just what I'm doing. Just laying out this. I want to have this go on an angle, 
but I don't well, I want the tubes to run right in front of it so I'm trying to measure this out see I made this a little bit too small so I'll just make this is just a pattern anyway just get a little more of an angle in there now in the last one I had this angle pretty much with the cowl angle I want to lay this piece back just a little bit more here these tubes for some reason drift back just a little bit more than on the first fuse I made so I want to take that into account when I make this pattern up it's just maybe a quarter of an inch further back got some real nice you can see the sea grain in this some nice sea grain so what I want to do of course is cross laminate it and put some of that carbon fiber in between Yeah, this blob violet carbon really laminates in nicely. I have to say that it really is nice to work with. Because once I get that angle in there, you can see the carbon even sticking through there. To get that angle in there, that's a nice, really nice, nice tight fit. I can get this right back to where I want it. And then I can put the angle, the opposite reverse angle in here. So this will be a nice butt joint into the, the little rib for the top block. Now I want to get a really good solid joint down there. Now I put the thin CA, oh. I'm just letting it walk around a coin, just like when you fuel proof a tank compartment. I just want to dress off, make sure I have a perfect mating surface here, because the former that's going inside the bottom block needs to match up to that, it needs to be a good match. Now, as I always suggest to do, is make sure you can get that six ounce tank. In this case, we ought to make a little bit of clear. Well, it looks like we can get it in and out without a problem. See, what would be a problem is if I had to vent in the middle. So I ought to take, I'll grind a little bit of this away just so I can get, give myself a little insurance policy that I can get the tank in and out. And all you need to do now, because we have this lamination here, we can just pull some of that away with a little sanding block and that'll give us a little bit of better angle to get the tank in. Okay now what I did I roughed out the line where this where this former will end onto the side of the fuselage then transposed it into here and I made up a little template a little pattern And then I finalized it by making up a piece with the carbon fiber sandwiched down the middle. I had to put a little, two little reliefs in here. Now what I like to do when I'm fitting up something where two parts have to mate, have to mate like this, I want to just tack that. I just put one drop on each end. I want to let that mate. Okay, and then I want to go over to the fuselage and make sure this is where that other former comes up. I catch this edge. Because when I put this block on for the final time, I'll want that edge to be fuel proof. That's a pretty good match. Next thing, I want to get thin CA in here and fuel proof this whole thing with thin CA, then run some back out here to a random edge, just so I don't have a, a solid line that may cause a stress rise. I just randomly brush it back like that and let it end at all different, all different edges. Now again, the whole idea here is not to have a stress riser anywhere. And it's thin CA, it'll not only stiffen up the plywood, it'll fuel proof it too. Now the last little thing I want to do is get a piece of aluminum tubing, make me a little 
oil outlet because what will happen is from the model from flying all day this little area will fill up with oil and just a little vent that that oil can get out. Well, you just rough out a hole here and then get a little sanding dowel and try to get that angle. I want to get all the angles to match if I can. You see, it's got to go right into the corner. It can't come up here or else oil will stay back here. By the way, that worked real good on the Spitfires too. Now it's always easier to grind this tubing on a on a belt sander and then match or at least get a close match rather than trying to grind through the aluminum. Now with aluminum tubing it's always good to rough it up a little bit so the glue gets a better bite. Now what I do is I line this end up and let this stick out extra and then get a little mark on here and trim the front. It's easier to trim the front than to keep shaving off the back. Always leave the front or, or whatever side is flat let this side sink in so it's almost perfect and then trim this before you glue it in now I try to get this as oh, come on there we go get this positioned as close this needs to go back ah. oh boy I want to get one drop of CA on here it guarantees something will go wrong. There we go. And just let that tack it in place before you glue it. And I just let the thick CA kick off and I can flip this over and just let it kick. I want to get all these areas really nice and solid with thick CA because I don't want any fuel getting in there. And even if a little bit does, I want that wood to be fuel proof. Once you assemble this, it's hard to get in there and fuel proof it. Now once that thin kicks off, then I can grind this right down with a sanding block. Now usually you have to sand it and go back and hit it with CA three or four times to build up all those little edges and ridges there. Now what I want to do, I want to put a former right in here. So by marking that location, and now when I line up the cowl, this is just to add a little extra rigidity to the nose. I don't have this in a Spitfire, but it might be cheap insurance. Now what I want to do is mark this off at a 90 degree angle and run me a little former in there. Again, this may, this may be getting into the area of overkill, I'm not sure, but I know these fuses are coming out light enough, plenty light, and I really think that'll give the, give the nose a little extra rigidity right where you pick it up all the time, too. I can just eyeball one of these guys in here. Now this is my pattern. See what I'm trying to do, I want to have this towed in just a little bit. What's happening as this thing sits out in the, in the damn cell, it's going back to being a, a little bit flatter than I want it to be. So this former will, for all purposes, hold it in place. I've made it just a little bit thinner, a couple of strokes of the sandpaper thinner. That by gluing this in, I should hold it in position well. Now I got it laminated up between two pieces of 16 C grain and of course I'll just trim this off after this kicks. Now just to get ahead on this, because this normally is something I would do when I put the wing in the body, I want to I want to get a little sheet of wood cross grain in here with the carbon going corner to corner so that this will now be a completed box. This will be a box with a triangle shape on it and that will stiffen this nose section up even more. It, weight that you put up here almost doesn't matter. It just seems irrelevant because you wind up, it's ahead of the CG, it's not hurting anything and you wind up 
after all this lightning and everything, you go and add a, an ounce of nose weight. So right now I want to get that piece in there. Then I can block sand this all down nice and flat. And that'll probably be it for today. I want the grain going side to side. This will be an easy way to do it. Make up the pattern. Okay, now I have a pattern. I can cut up the piece a little bit oversized and put that X of carbon in there. Now what I've been doing is getting one piece on, letting it dry, get the other piece on and let it dry. Then putting thick CA on the whole piece and squashing it right together and clamping it, getting some weight on it with a sanding block for a couple of minutes while that thick CA kicks off. And this way it's really squeezed down there. I really got a really interesting air show video from Richard Neal. Oh yeah, that kicked off nice. And now by jigsawing this piece out, actually you don't think it is until it's time to do it. You really can't cut this conveniently with a, uh, a number 11 blade. As soon as you run an 11 blade through there, it's finished. That's how stiff that material is. But best thing is just go and dremel it out. Now we certainly may be getting into the area of overkill, but I don't think you can ever make the nose too strong. I need to trim this just a little bit. Now what I did before, as I did this while the battery was recharging, made this little piece of plywood to go around the exhaust stack so it would continue. I want I want this the whole lip to be one rigid like a horseshoe. And I guess you know if you were building a plane that's already coming out too heavy these are the kind of things that amount to be luxury items but these are coming out both of these are coming out so light that uh, we can afford to make them a lot more rigid up in that front. Now I had a little bit of a brainstorm here and I'm going to see if I can make this fi this fixture up. What I want to do is I want to trace out the bottom of the fuselage. And then what I want to do is laminate a couple pieces of quarter inch square or eighth inch square even into the position so that when I take this off and I put my shell on, it'll keep the shell from spreading. See, what's happening, the shell is relaxing. If I was making this shell and then next week I was going to make the plane, well, it would be a different story. But I'm going to, it's going to be a couple of weeks before we actually get to assemble a plane. So I want this shell, for all purposes, to sit in a, in a position where it's being squeezed back into position. So I have three other wings to work on. While I'm working on the wings, this doesn't wind up flattening, flattening, flattening out. So I'm going to trace this out on here, and I can give this a shot. I really don't see any harm that can happen. Let's see if it works. It, it may be another gizmo we can use. And you can use, actually, you can use up one of these, what I'll call scrap pieces. Well, it's not really scrap. It's just too heavy to be used for a, a good plane. This Richard Neal video, by the way, has some F-82 pictures that even I had never seen. I didn't was not aware they had an F-82, a flyable one. Nice video. Rich, thanks a whole lot. So, you know, that represents the actual width of the fuselage. So we're going to come in. Maybe I'll start with an eighth of an inch and see how that works out. Because what I want to do is put it under compression. So what's going to happen is I'm actually going to store it in here. It'll let the wood relax in that bent state. Then when I take it out, it should relax back to where it'll fit on here perfectly. I'm 
just bringing this almost like laminating on a cap strip. Let each section dry. Trying to finalize this fit up in the front here. So this slides yeah, up. Okay. Alright, now I got a pretty good gauge on how I want to do this. I can run some thin CA across the whole thing now. A little bit of an improvement over the original first idea. But then that's what this always boils down to is an idea, then a variation on an idea, something that's a little bit better. A little improvement. Okay, now this piece, for all purposes, I should be able to fit this right in. And I just thought of another good idea. See, one idea leads to another idea. This will hold this in position until we get time to install it. Now I also, I can put a little bit of tension on it if I want. I can just uh, shove some shims in there if I decide I need them. Now the idea here is I can shim this. Again, I don't know if this is necessary. I can go, let's try a 16. And just leave the shim in there. Yeah, that works fine. It actually works fine. Just an example of one idea that becomes an even better idea. Okay, so now I have a really good, a good way of storing this in that little fixture. I even have the shim along the little side. Now maybe that's an idea we could use even on the top block. I don't know. This is just a piece of 3 8 I think that's a better way of storing it than just laying it somewhere or just laying it when whatever. And when I'm all done, of course, I can strip that off, sand that down, and I have a brand new piece of wood, so... All right, on the next tape, we're getting near the end of this tape. On the next tape, we're going to start on working on the wings. We pretty much have the body under control. Joe already has his body, and we have a lot of, a lot of stuff to work on wing-wise. That'll start on the next tape. And I'm really glad we got to this point in the uh, fuselage construction now. We pretty much can, well, we'll see tomorrow. Put this away for the time being, and when we come back to it, we know that the shell won't have already spread out or opened or distorted or whatever. I want to thank Richard Neal who sent in this video and this is a good one. If you want to view any of these or borrow them or steal them or rip them off, whatever, this is the Richard Neal Confederate Air Force show. Just let me know. Fifi was down in Teterboro not long ago by the way. Now, I hope some of these little ideas and gizmos that you can get off of the video, you can put to your own use. And I hope now that I'm the District 2, uh, you know, pamper rep, whatever, I'll be able to pass even more information on. This is certainly coming out nice. We wish, uh, we just wish we had more time here. Thanksgiving is tomorrow. I can smell a turkey cooking up there already. We have the canopy mold coming from Midgley. He's already called and said it's already left New Hampshire, so that's on its way. I hope this is now something that uh, we can pretty much do at will anytime we want. Hey, even a little aluminum screw. Anyway, just one more little part of our program. Canopy mold coming. By the way, this Bob Violet stuff has just gotten to be uh, very handy to use. I like using this a lot better than the ribbon. It's definitely an improvement. Again, you can get this from Bob Violet Models. I think I put the uh, address on there. And it comes in all different widths and sizes. This is good material to have, that's for sure. We made up a good supply of sanding blocks here. Some 100, 150, 220. 
just all little scrap blocks of wood you can have that have a nice smooth surface, run them on a belt sander, sticky back sandpaper, boy, worth its weight in gold. Now I noticed another thing last time I was down at Home Depot, they have another brand, this is Norton, but they have another brand, I guess it's the Home Depot version of this brand that's that's about half the price. I'll buy some of that next time and see if it is worth if the glue is the same and the sandpaper. This is no-load sandpaper, so it's real nice. Oh, man, just watching this video over and over. That F-82 blows my mind. Anyway, I'm going to end out this video with a couple of minutes of this tape from Richard Neal. Thank everybody for joining us, watching it. It's been fun. And see what happens. You get to the end of the tape, just play it over again. <laughs> That's what I love about this stuff. I hear the family up there getting ready, so we are at the end of the tape. Thanks a whole lot for joining us. Kiss the Air Force goodnight. Kiss the kids goodnight. And happy Thanksgiving to your family from mine. Especially from me. Happy holiday! <laughs> Look at this laundry. Oh my, sick of that camera. What? What? Where's that Thanksgiving turkey? Don't cut the turkey. Look, I'm getting thrown out of my own house. I don't believe it. Where's my supper? This is what you want to see happen, Adam Musco. Hey, Wendy. Hey, I thought I put that bell crank in a little better. Oh, no. Can you picture this? Oh, man. See, this is what happens if you don't use pro stunt controls. Don't go cheap on that bell crank, man. Look at this. Nice P40. Oh, man, I love this stuff.